regulatory environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Eric Hartnett. I'm the Director of Electronic Resources at Texas A&M University and the host for today's event. Our topic today is Resource Management in Folio, a first look. Today's session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted, and we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. Use the question box within WebEx to enter questions and comments as they come to you. The speakers will address the questions at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Our speakers today are Kristen Martin, Electronic Resources Management Librarian at the University of Chicago, and Kristen Wilson, Associate Head of Acquisitions and Discovery at North Carolina State University. Kristen and Kristen are both members of the Folio Resource Management Special Interest Group. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Kristen. Hi, so this is Kristen Martin, and thank you everyone for coming today, and thank you Eric. Eric is also a member of our Resource Management Special Interest Group, and we're delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you about what we've been up to uh, on the Folio project. So I do have a few introductory slides to discuss um, what Folio is, and I realize that this may be um, things that you already know, so I'm going to try to keep it brief, but at the same time, in case there's people that are relatively new to the project, I want to just give this overview. So Folio is an open source library services platform, and it's, built, it's being built to support ILS functionality and encourage innovation. And the basic tenets of Folio are that it has um, community development, oops, too far, I think. There we go. Okay, it has community development, and that's where we are coming in as members of functional experts on the resource management SIG. Uh, it is designed to be open source using the Apache 2 license, and we are um, working on making a very modular product, sort of uh, like a platform with apps built on top of it, and, um, and we are hoping that this will take library LSPs into sort of modern software design. It can be either supported locally and implemented at your institution, or there we expect there will be vendors that will be able to support it for you. So here's just a uh, slide that you might have seen before, but in case not, this talks a little bit about the Folio architecture. The platform itself has these three layers. You've got the bottom system layer, then you have the OCopy gateway where the APIs and communication between different systems occur, and then there's also a UI toolkit. Uh, what we focus on in the, the Resource Management Special Interest Group, or Resource Management SIG, is the apps that are going to be built on using, onto that system layer, using that gateway and the toolkit. And so we specifically are focusing on electronic resources management and acquisition functionality. So one final um, slide here on general folio development, just to talk a little bit about how this is going on. Um, in previous projects where I've worked, we have, you know, gone through, talked about strategy, it's been developed, and then it truly has been like the, the user experience, user interface has been absolutely the last thing to be looked at. So here we've really been doing a more iterative approach where the user interface is being considered as almost one of the first things and then informing how we develop and informing what strategies we want. So when we show you the prototype, it's going to be a very visual experience. There isn't actually like a database underneath it that um, we're manipulating, but we're showing you what we want it to look like. So that is totally the end of the general info slides, and now I just have a couple to talk about the resource management SIG and what our specific role and what our charge is. So the resource management SIG is working with the developers to define essential functions for acquiring and managing all types of materials. We decided we didn't want to break up into an electronic resources and uh, sort of more general acquisitions. We wanted to really consider these holistically. It means we have a fairly broad charge. We're looking at 
typical acquisitions activities like orders, licensing, financial management. Uh, we're looking at access and authentication methods. We're also looking at evaluation through usage statistics or other um, potential possibilities. And we're considering reporting, although there is a separate reporting SIG that is getting developed right now, and we expect we'll be working in concert with them. As part of this work, we're trying to determine the appropriate relationship of the re appropriate representations of relationships between resources and what are the mechanisms and workflows that we need to be able to support these general functions or essential functions, I should say. Um, additionally, we're evaluating the potential for applications that can support selection, decision making, and analysis. We do have a separate selection task group that is um, kind of meeting as a, independently of the main resource management SIG to look at this rather large area. Uh, and we're trying to identify and advise the developers on coordination that might be needed between what we're doing and some other functions that the system's going to have, like metadata management, resource access, I already mentioned reporting too. Uh, and we're advising the developers on interactions that might be needed between library vendors and any other party so that we can have successful resource management. Because we all know there isn't exactly like a one size fits all, a one box to do everything. And as part of that, we're trying to make sure whatever we decide right now, this current work is not going to limit our future innovation. And that is, I think, one of the nice things about the platform app so that things can get updated in an iterative process. Or if something isn't working for you, you can swap it out with something else. So I did want to just introduce uh, in absentia Philip Jacobson, who is the um, UX UI designer that we've been working with. This was back in a meeting we had in November um, at MIT where we were talking about workflows. And now I'm going to jump into the heart of this presentation. So yeah, that barely took me over five minutes um, where we're going to do a walkthrough of the resource management life cycle. And as part of this walkthrough, I'm also going to show what the development process has been like for us. So you'll see both some initial um, sketches that Philip presented us with and then how those sketches have gotten transformed into a more interactive demo. So I'm going to bounce back and forth between slides and the demo and hopefully everything technically will work out well. And, I'm, and Kristen Wilson and I are also going to bounce back and forth a little bit on who is showing what. So the first area I'd like to talk about is selection. So initially we thought hmm, maybe selection's a little out of scope, you know, usually we're getting things and they've already been selected. But then as we had more conversations, we realized that um, the desire to support the discovery of new resources um, really is part of resource management. And there are mechanisms for automated selection, there's mechanisms for um, selector-driven selections, and different libraries have sort of different levels and different individuals who are doing all of this. So, we wanted to support this variety of acquisition mechanisms. We wanted to be able to interface and communicate with different vendor tools and integrate the selection with all the usual acquisition processes that might happen within, you know, traditional ILS functionality, as well as supporting faculty and user requests. So in some of the initial designs, and these designs I put in the slides, and then when we get over to the prototype, um, we'll do a little more interactive. So Philip sketched out some initial things and like, here, you know, is an example of, okay, you've, you've searched for something, you're going to add it to a list, um, maybe you want to request an item, um, here you can submit information to the library if you're a user, uh, and so this then translated to the prototype, and now I'm going to switch over to that prototype. And, um, and this URL, by the way, is shared in the slides too. So this is something that you can just go to, it's out there on the web, and you can play around with it. And ultimately, um, it's still in process. So it's not done, there isn't a database behind it. Um, but these are some of the different uh, apps and functionality that have been placed into the prototype. And there's these little buttons up here all kind of indicate some different um, functionality. And right now, when you click on them, you'll get a little welcome screen um, that'll talk about like what this is. So here we're going to our task list or to-do section, um, and we're going to show selection here. Uh, when you look at the prototype, you're always going to see 
this opening slide, but in real life, if you were using a system, it wouldn't always show you an opening slide. So, you know, just keep that in mind. And also keep in mind as I show things here, not everything is functional. Like, you know, you can go ahead and try searching, but your search isn't actually going to change anything. So in this example on the to-do list, and I will come back to the to-do list a little bit later, we're showing a purchase suggestion. Um, coming here for the Grace of Wrath by Luboslava Mazni. So this purchase suggestion is going into a particular list. Um, so he was able to pull up, okay, well, here's kind of the work record. Here's some different versions. You might, you know, choose to get more than one version. You might um, choose to get something else. Uh, communication with the user is also listed here, so you can sort of tell where you are with your purchase request very quickly, like have they been notified when you actually get it, um, when is this closed, and, um, and then down here, depending on what your workflow is in your library, maybe you want to order it right now, you go ahead and you select your fund, you add some tags, and then um, you could order it from a vendor, create a purchase order manually, uh, that could be like, you know, real quick, order, or it can also then go into your um, sort of general acquisition orders workflow that Kristen Wilson will help walk through. So um, we're going to come back to explore this to-do list at the end of the presentation in more detail. And now I'm going to jump back to the slides, and I'm going to turn it over to Kristen Wilson, who will talk about um, acquisitions. And let's see, you probably want the screen so you can move around yourself. So I'm going to stop sharing briefly and move the ball over. Right, Thanks, Kristen. I think you just need to make me the presenter as well. Yes, it didn't quite take. Uh, there okay. you go. Okay. Um, can you see my slides all right now, Kristen? Yes, they are there. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Kristen, uh, for starting this off, too. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the core acquisitions workflow and the work that we've been doing to create prototypes for those features. So um, Kristen kind of introduced the charge of the resource management SIG which is very broad, but we have been kind of focusing on this whole continuum of the resource management lifecycle. I would say at this point, uh, we've been focusing on kind of the, the most core features to begin with, so the financials, the ordering, invoicing, licensing, renewals, some of the other features like access and authentication, usage, reporting, we haven't quite gotten into in depth yet, although we're trying to keep in mind that those will be essential and everything we do should kind of set us up to do those things as well. So I'm going to talk about the areas that we have been spending the most time on, and I think these illustrate really nicely the way that the, the concept of an RM SIG and not kind of separate, separating acquisitions from resource management or e-resource management has been really beneficial because we're not, um, we're not kind of following the path of a traditional ILS necessarily. You know, we're saying we're dealing with ordering, but we're also dealing with licensing. We're also dealing with subscription management. And so that's all kind of um, been pushed together in the way that we've done our work. Um, the idea of capturing relationships between all uh, types of resources and types of records has also been really core to the way that we're thinking about everything, and I think the prototypes will show kind of the interrelated nature of the way that we are attempting to design the system, being able to actually map relationships and navigate relationships within Folio. And then um, coordinating with the other SIGs is also particularly important, and metadata management is the one that will be most obvious in that um, the work that we're doing touches on things like Viv and holding in item records, although we're not as concerned necessarily with the content of those records, but more with the relationships and the way that they fit into the work that we're doing. Um, another key aspect of the resource management work has been uh, the idea that we will be using a central knowledge base within Folio. 
And the idea here is that there will be some kind of database of resources, be they journals or books or electronic resources or other types of resources like video or data. And this, this knowledge base in terms of what it actually is, is still kind of evolving. Um, because EBSCO is involved in the project, there's some assumption that EBSCO's knowledge base will integrate with the system. But we are also really concerned with making sure that we're not limiting ourselves to only a single knowledge base. So because of the open architecture of Folio, we're hopeful that there'll be opportunities to integrate with other existing knowledge bases and to be able to integrate with knowledge bases in the future if knowledge bases for different types of content begin to emerge. And the goal with using the knowledge base is really to kind of have that, that central, almost like authority of what, what are the resources that you're dealing with and have all the various aspects of the system feed into that knowledge base. So from the RM perspective, you know, we're be, we'll be managing purchases and licenses and access, and all of those things should tie into resources in the knowledge base. Um, but the other, other areas like selection, cataloging, even um, resource access and inventory will also feed into that knowledge base as well and hopefully allow us to create uh, connections across the system so that you could say, this license describes this specific resource uh, and maybe has some permissions for how it's used and that can be um, translated into business rules that might determine, you know, lending policies and that type of thing on the access side. So really hoping to be able to make those connections. So now I'm also going to show some of the sketches and prototypes that we've been creating for these different areas. So I'll start off with finances. And so this is kind of your basic fund structure um, that we've been working on uh, designing and coming up with some ideas. And in all of these, I think we've done a really good job of sort of establishing the baseline of what, what do libraries do now, what's important to us, and then also starting to think about how could we do this better. So for uh, the finances, one, the main thing here is really the creation of funds and allocation of money to those funds. So like a traditional ILS, you'll be able to create funds, you'll be able to say that there's a certain amount of money in those funds and be able to monitor how much has been spent and how much is left. Some of the, the things that we talked about that maybe take this to the next step, um, one thing that's come up really um, from a lot of different libraries is this idea that a lot of fund structures that libraries use don't really, um, they're, they're kind of workarounds to be able to do other things. So um, just for example, at my library, we create a very elaborate system of funds and many of those funds don't even have money allocated to them. They're basically just ways of saying that a certain purchase supports a, a subject area. And so um, we have talked about some ideas like using tagging as an alternative to creating basically fake funds to just to tag things so we could just actually use tags. Um, and then we've talked about ideas like there's this circle down below with the idea of the pseudo fund, which is um, to kind of be able to create a hierarchy of funds to say, well, the money is actually here, but maybe there's several sub funds that draw on that bigger pool of money, but have different purposes in terms of associating money with a certain subject area. So there may be a couple ways that we can come at that. So now I'll switch over to the prototype and we can look at the funds here. And so this is the little money symbol up above. And so when I go into the prototype, um, you can see this looks a, a good deal like the sketch. It's pretty basic at this point, but the idea is that you'll be able to go into this module, view all your funds, um, add new funds, potentially manage your tags if you're using that type of system. Um, another thing that's been really important is that we've talked a lot about the idea of 
being able to more visually and more easily monitor the status of your funds. So we definitely know that we want to have some kind of nice status dashboard that will have um, kind of the, the key high-level information about each fund and maybe have some visualizations that will allow people to kind of get a, a quick glance of what's going on with a fund. And then perhaps this can also be translated into a kind of dashboard concept. So if you're a selector who manages multiple funds, you might be able to have a dashboard that shows all your funds and you can see the status of each one. So kind of bringing together unique views of different funds. And for some reason, my computer is not liking the usual swiping. So um, try to get past that. So the next uh, stage that I'll talk about is ordering. And so this ties in nicely to the selection uh, screens that Kristen was showing. So when he, the idea is that when um, an order request is made, and that may be made by a library staff member, it may come externally from a library user, that you would have um, kind of your list of order requests like um, Kristen was showing in the to-do list. And that from these, you have your different purchase options. Um, and we're hoping, you know, this is almost like another form of knowledge base. If there are vendors out there that Folio can form connections with, we can actually bring in some of this information from APIs to be able to say, this particular item is available through YBP or a different vendor or whoever, and you can actually just choose one of those and hopefully be able to auto-populate some of the information for your order like price and that type of thing. Um, of course, there's going to be orders that are not so simple, especially for things like databases and journal and ebook packages where you're having to get custom quotes and go back and forth with the vendor. And so um, this is going to tie into um, the later discussion about kind of like productivity and management applications within Folio. But the goal is that if you're working kind of externally with a vendor to get a quote and negotiate the details of a purchase, that those that email correspondence will be able to be integrated into Folio. And then, of course, there'll be um, fairly, fairly traditional ordering functionality that basically allows you to track the nuts and bolts of your order. So as you place an order, you'll be able to assign a fund, uh, possibly use tags again, to capture different information about that order. So right now, this is presented very generically just as tags. Um, some of these may become more specific fields like material type um, or you know that type of thing. And then some of them will be still the ability to have generic tags that each library can customize. Um, and then there'll be you know notices like if it's going to over encumber a fund to place this order or anything like that, you'll be able to um, understand what's happening and make a choice about what you want to do. Um, and of course, um, it's not shown here, but there will be an order record that lists the price and that lists all the different details and tags and categories about each order. So I'll move back into the prototype and pull up. Oh, you know what? We actually do not yet have an order prototype. So um, there's not anything to show here now. Um, again, as Kristen said, this is a work in progress. So that will probably be something that we'll have coming soon. Um, oh, but actually, I will show, that's what I meant to do, is to show um, we do have an invoicing prototype in here. And so that um, ties very closely into the orders. And so again, this is fairly straightforward. You'll ha be able to have your invoices, be able to search and filter to find what you're looking for, be able to see your invoice information, and then see links out to the orders that those, um, those invoices are for. And we've been talking a lot um, with Philip Jacobson, the UX designer, um, about kind of the business logic behind this as well. So we've been getting past just kind of, yeah, we want to see an invoice record and really starting to talk about things like what happens when you encumber something? What happens when you pay something? What are the different types of orders and invoices needed? And so now that we have this kind of framework set up, I think it, that's helping to facilitate the discussion of really getting into 
into what does it mean to do this work within this system, and I expect that the prototypes will kind of evolve to reflect that as well. Uh, so next I'll talk about licenses, and uh, this is a good example of the way that functionality that might traditionally be more associated with an ERM system than an ILS is being integrated very closely into the Folio platform. So um, the idea with licenses is that as you are acquiring a resource, if it's something that needs to be licensed, you'll be able to create a license record um, and use that to both you know, track the things that you've licensed in your documents, but also to hopefully support some workflow aspects of that as well. Uh, so the license record will have kind of your basic license record components, so things like just a human readable title and description, um, the ability to attach documents and possibly even have the full text of the license that maybe would be searchable within the system. Um, some assignments, so being able to basically assign this license to the resources that it covers, and this is a good example of getting into the relationship side of things, so being able to say um, that this license covers something like a particular book, probably an ebook. it might cover an entire package, it might cover an entire platform, um, or even a vendor, so being able to assign this license at the right level to say this is, this is what this license is for. So then we can go into the prototype to look at licenses as well. And so um, these are pretty consistent with the other features we've looked at. Um, I think there's definitely a desire to have kind of a consistent look and feel throughout the system. So again, you'll be able to view, search, filter your licenses, create new licenses. Um, You'll see the, um, from the prototype we've been translated over here to the overall description of the license, the text of the license, and then the resources that this license is assigned to. And so what's nice about this, and I think this sort of gets into this relationship aspect again, is that when you're looking at a license, you'll be able to see here are all the, the titles and the packages, et cetera, that are associated with this, and you'll actually be able to click on the names of those things and kind of navigate from the license module, say, into a different module where you can actually see um, that record and go back and forth. So there'll be a lot of um, nice navigation features that kind of let you explore your collection and your records within the system. And then finally, um, I'll talk a little bit about the collection itself. So within uh, the prototype, the sketches, uh, we had initially kind of conceived of this idea of a collection. So rather than saying a catalog, which tends to limit um, people to thinking about bibs and holdings and items and kind of your traditional catalog records, we wanted to show that the collection really goes beyond just that those types of records. But the, you know, the bib and your traditional descriptive records are really important. And so that will kind of be the, the mainstay of the collection idea. So um, as I said earlier, we're not so concerned necessarily with um, what is in the bib record. So we're not necessarily concerned with mark field or even if people are using a, a standard that's different from mark, but just this idea that we know a bib record exists um, and it has, a bib might have multiple holding and item records. So we want to make sure that we have those records, that they're usable within the system, that it's easy to navigate from a bib to its related items. And so you can see that all here. Um, and then the item record is very similar. Um, you know, you'll see whatever metadata is on that record and be able to see the relationship with different bib records and move back and forth between that. Um, on the item record here as well, you can see that there is um, over in the right-hand column a purchase request. So if a request has been made for this particular item, you'll be able to get back and forth from the item to the purchase request. So that's, again, building out those relationships within the system. 
And then I think what really makes this collection concept a lot more robust is that it's not just limited to bibs and holdings and items. We also really want to see kind of the influence of the knowledge base making its way into the collection. So here um, we've got sketches for package records and platform records. So the idea with the package is that you'll be able to group things into um, kind of a model of how they've, they've actually been sold to you by the publisher. So if things are bundled together, you have a big deal, you can create that package record and you can say these, these items or these holdings are actually a part of that package. Um, and then that package can be linked up to things like a platform, it can be linked to a license record, and that allows you to do things like say, this, li this license governs uh, my Elsevier Freedom Collection package, so now I know that every holding that's a part of that package is also governed by that license. So you can kind of, again, see the relationships and the way that they trickle down across the system. Um, and then the platform is kind of just gives another level as well, because you might have, um, you know, if you have Elsevier Freedom Collection package, but you may have a lot of other Elsevier packages as well, back files and eBooks. And so the platform might allow you to say, show me everything on the Science Direct platform, um, and can be associated with things like access rights, um, contacts for, um, the people who support those things, um, and so it creates, again, this very rich relationship between everything that has to do with the resources that a library is purchasing. And so um, if I pop into the prototype, uh, we've got several prototype apps that kind of illustrate this, and uh, Philip did actually end up kind of breaking down the collection concept into several different apps for the prototype, just because we felt like having a single collection app might be too broad and that people might want to be able to go directly to the things that they're interested in. So I'll start with this one, which is the bibliographic record prototype. And again, it's got that consistent look and feel. Um, you'd be able to look at any given bib record search filter, see the metadata, and then again, see those relationships. So see related items, related platforms, um, possibly related packages as well. So if you're looking at a title, say this was an ebook, you could say, I want to see all the platforms that this ebook is available to me on, and you'll actually be able to have that view. So again, I think it's a nice illustration of how we're kind of bringing together components of ILS, knowledge base, and ERM into a single system. This one is the item records, and this is very similar to um, the bib records. And so there's not a specific app in here right now for holding records, um, and I think the, the distinction between holdings and items right now is maybe a little blurry and needs to be kind of crystallize a little bit better, but I think the idea with the holding and item level is that it's also an opportunity to have a more granular view of that item. So an item could be a physical print copy in your library that could be checked out, but you may also have a holding that um, for an e-resource might say, this is the version of this title as it appears in my Elsevier Freedom Collection on the Science Direct platform. And, for the, and that's really where you're going to attach things like licenses and packages and where those relationships live on kind of a more granular level. And then, let's see. We looked at licenses. Okay, so here's uh, the packages prototype. Again, very similar. It's got kind of the, the look and feel and also the relationship. So I can go to any given package. I can see what's in this package, what are the terms that govern it. It's, a, another, again, a very rich view of that metadata. And then the last one is the platforms prototype, which, again, is quite similar. Um, I think one thing that was unique here was this idea 
that there might be some interest in being able to have a sort of review and comments feature, possibly at the platform level, possibly um, at other levels as well. And there was a Folio forum late last year that kind of talked about this concept for ebook platforms and the idea that of having some kind of um, some kind of ability to say, I tested the, this platform for different functionalities and these things did or didn't work, and maybe that helps you decide if you're going to buy a resource, which platform is best for me based on my past experiences or based on the experiences of other users. Um, and that actually is the last uh, prototype that I'll show. But the one thing that I will mention here is just one of the key concepts that's come out of all this is this idea of being able to share a lot of this knowledge. Because a lot of the, the things we're talking about here, information like which titles are in a particular package, um, how does a certain platform behave, uh, descriptive information for resources, a lot of that is really very similar across libraries. And so we also see kind of the folio knowledge base and collection concept as an opportunity to share that knowledge. So we've talked about possibilities that some of the information that we've ta I've just talked about could actually be global and shared across Folio users or maybe even shared more broadly and that that would help um, kind of with management challenges in terms of keeping information up to date, managing changes as um, titles move into different packages or get bought and sold between publishers. There's some opportunities there to do some of that work collaboratively. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Kristen Martin, and she'll talk a little bit about some of the productivity support apps that we've been talking about um, building into the system. All right, if you want to pass me the ball, I will go ahead and share my screen. And I'm going to jump back into the PowerPoint here. Um, so we've walked through a lot of the um, general acquisitions resource management apps. And now the, the apps that I'm going to be talking about to close out our presentation have to do with productivity support. And I think that it's worth noting that they really highlight the value of doing this modular architecture and that they could be applied to any variety of regular tasks. And while I'll be talking about them in a resource management context, they can also be applied to other um, tasks within the library, you know, anything having to do with cataloging workflows or circulation support. Um, they are designed to be customizable so that a library can specifically fit whatever their needs are. And then to highlight the sharing theme that Kristen Wilson brought up, um, they can be shared both among and between libraries and vendors. So I'm going to go through three examples here of a workflow, um, the to-do app, which we already saw a preview of when looking at selection, and email integration. So the first thing that we started talking about very early on was workflow support. And this is something that um, is particularly critical, I think, for electronic resources management. It could just be my bias because that is my area of expertise. But this came up as something that we really wanted support. And we also felt like it kind of existing um, workflow support that was out there did some things well but failed in other ways. And so we wanted to take some of the best characteristics of different systems and be able to merge it in together. And when we were talking a little bit about it, sometimes a workflow needs to be sort of manually set off. Like a situation happens, you realize what's going on, you put a workflow into effect. Other times your workflow might have an automatic trigger. And in this case, like let's say you're purchasing a new database, um, that you know creation of the purchase of that order request can actually trigger some sort of an access workflow put it in the system. Um, 
And additionally, we were thinking, hey, you know, sometimes you're doing a workflow and things do not go as planned. So these workflows need to be able to be adjustable. Maybe your workflow is going in one direction, but then you determine that you actually have to go in a different direction. So I'm going to shift over to the prototype uh, back on the home screen. So this little lightning bolt right now represents workflows. This is one of the uh, most fleshed out of the apps in the prototype, so it has the most things you can click on and play with. Um, now we have an example here of uh, an actually a pretty simple workflow, but it really shows the power. So in this particular case, um, what's here is we have the suggest purchase for high holds item. So let's say you've got, in this case, a physical item. You have a book, and once it reaches a certain number of holds on it, uh, that could trigger an automatic purchase request. Uh, so this is something that might really help you with um, realizing when you need to buy a second copy, maybe you want to get an unlimited simultaneous user ebook to support your work. Um, this workflow area over here shows you can kind of set your variable. That's what will be your automated trigger. Um, then you can assign it to a specific person and, um, you know, maybe nothing happens, you might go ahead and erase the workflow. Um, and then, although it's not editable in the prototype, you could sort of drag your conditions around, you could add new ones in there. Um, and so, let's say you're in an academic library, you don't have holds, you have recalls, there could be other things you could try to keep track of with a particular item, you know. So, so you could customize it for what your library needs. Um, and you know, this, this particular example shows a print example, but you could also do a workflow for, you know, an acquisition of a new database, as I suggested earlier. Uh, you can see, you could set your own categories, grouping your workflows. Um, and if you wanted to, you know, go ahead and create a new workflow, you could kind of do one from scratch using a, you know, a pretty simple interface. Or you could go to the workflow store, which is um, a way that within your library and between libraries or even between vendors, you could share workflows. So if everybody's using the same subscription agent, you could share a workflow for like when you order a new title. Um, and that might be very similar across other libraries working with that agent. Um, you can then here, if you're searching your workflow store, you can put in your keywords, you'd have filters, um, you would be able to kind of look for things in particular areas. And then you could just go ahead and import the workflow into your, um, into your library. Uh, we, we were showing this at um, ERNL, which was amazingly just a week ago, and it generated a lot of discussion. And so one of the things that you can't really see on the prototype but that we have been talking about is that um, there's different layers that you, and levels that you might need to know about a workflow. If you're a person who's assigned a workflow, you kind of just need to know what you're supposed to do and where you are and then be able to move it on and, and indicate that something is done. If you're a manager, you might want to know where is the whole workflow universe? Like what is, you know, maybe at a particular point of a workflow when you're looking at new acquisitions coming in, what is still waiting to be completed. And you may also want to be interested if you are trying to figure out how long is it taking us to um, get a new acquisition from order to availability. Uh, what are some of the hang-up points that's going on? Is there an individual who seems to be, you know, struggling with doing certain steps? Does um, he or she need more support or is there some problem with a particular vendor? Uh, so these are all things where having data can help. Oops, I just bounced back to PowerPoint. Sorry about that. Um, and so we, we had a lot of conversations about that. And then additionally, we are also thinking, thinking ahead. Um, you know, the workflow store initially might be kind of small, but it could grow to be quite extensive and robust. So having some controls over, depending on what your staff level is, like what workflows can you choose? You can see that by categorizing and filtering them, you could say, hey, you know what? I really like the workflows that X university is doing because I know that the way that we handle acquisitions is very similar. Um, so I want to look for things from them. Um, I want my acquisition staff not to be able to edit workflows, but my supervisor to have that ability. So those are all things that we think um, we'll be able to do with the workflow. All right, so now I'm going to jump back over here to uh, another uh, productivity is support and trouble, t and trouble ticketing. This 
is not fleshed out quite as fully in the demo, but we will go over to the prototype and show some examples. So we've had some conversations about this already, and one of the things that we learned is that a lot of us are using some sort of ticketing system or, you know, customer um, relations management system or CRM as it's known to deal with the troubleshooting. Um, so even though we're resource management and we're not generally kind of considered uh, out there public services staff, we do have, um, a lot of our units do have this public services component. And here, if we can get this integration in to Folio, then we can um, actually associate tickets with a particular resource to help keep track of what are the problems, where are they, is there a vendor who's having issues, are, the, are we seeing the same problem, and so we have a solution that's readily available. So I'm going to go over to the prototype again and go back to that um, earlier to-do list. So go to get started. Now we saw the purchase suggestion and like I said this is not particularly fleshed out but you can see here you could sort sort of your patron support request. You could make these lists for anything. So this ties back into that workflow. This is where you as like the recipient of a particular task can go to look at your work. Um, you know, when you finish something, you can decide, okay, this is done. Um, you know, maybe you are waiting for a vendor response and they told you that, you know, pricing for this item is not coming out for two months because we don't know what all the titles are going to be in this package. You could snooze it as a reminder. Um, maybe it's outside of your area. You could reassign it. Um, you know, maybe this workflow is just not going anywhere and you don't even need to keep it. You could just delete it. Um, if you are working with a lot of different types of tasks from, you know, licensing to technical support to um, purchase suggestions, you may also need to try to organize things. So there is a way that we've been talking about for organizing your tasks to help you in your work so that you're not sort of faced with like another inbox just full of stuff, which is how my email feels a lot of times. I'm like, oh my gosh, what's important, what's not? It can be really hard to find out. So here we can use some of the same logic you might be applying to your inbox about, you know, highlighting emails from certain people or shunting things into certain areas. So let's say that you have patron requests. Maybe you want them to go to your patron request ticket, uh, your patron request to-do list. Or, you know, you've got some licenses going on. You can have a licensing list. Again, you have like sort of patron uh, trouble ticketing. You can put that in a particular um, list. Or, you know, every time that like your boss emails you, you want that to go to its own list or not emails, but every time your boss assigns something to you, you're, you're sticking it in its own place. Um, so this list logic can help with the organization. So now jumping back over to the PowerPoint um, for a moment. So since I have been talking about email and the vast amount of work that we're all doing in our email, one of the challenges with email is that information that's in your inbox ends up sort of living with you and the institution doesn't always get that knowledge and it's a lot of work to try to get that knowledge out of your inbox and into a more systematized fashion. So we had um, several conversations about email integration um, and we were particularly thinking about this like from a licensing example if you're going back and forth on different terms, a lot of times that's happening over email. How could we capture some of that? Or what if you are, you know, having a dispute about what content, what content is supposed to be in a particular package? Maybe you need to clarify that so that if the vendor says, well, normally book X isn't part of the package, but since we gave it to you in 2007, we're going to honor it now, even though somebody buying the package now doesn't get that title. Like having that kind of history that, you know, gives you context or gives you additional information that maybe even your license doesn't have, it can be really helpful. So in this cross-functional um, app, we were thinking about it working in a variety of contexts. So where you would be able to see your email history, you could associate it with a particular uh, title, you could associate it with a license, or you could associate it with, you know, just a, a vendor, and you might be able to look at it in some different ways. So if I go over here, um, to the the contacts app on the prototype. 
Hello. There we go. Um, oops, I clicked on bibs, sorry. Let me, there we go. Um, so here's contacts. So maybe you want to see like, well, here's John Doe. Like who has talked to John Doe? Who's working with him? So if multiple people are working with him and somebody's out, you'd be able to know what's going on and where a particular situation lives. Maybe John Doe doesn't work there anymore. You can put some comments in here. Oh, you know what? John Doe got responsibilities are now Jane Doe. Here's, you know, John Doe's um, history with a license. But, you know, John Doe also is doing some technical support. Um, so all that can be represented at the contact level or if you have it affiliated with a particular resource or platform, this, um, this correspondence could be associated at that level. And um, we were talking a little bit about this. Uh, there's obviously a lot of chaff that gets in to email. A lot of things that are transient, maybe you don't want to keep them forever. So, you know, we do anticipate having a really good search and filter functionality to be able to um, keep track of what's important and what's not. All right, so um, that is actually the last functionality that I wanted to show in the prototype. And then um, the slides do contain some links and then we'll open it up for questions. So first of all, if, if this sounds interesting to you and you'd like to find out some more, um, you can go to the uh, Folio Resource Management SIGs page on the wiki, and there you'll find um, our members, and our members are very loose, it's very um, fluid, so if you feel like you wanna join, you are welcome. If you feel like you just wanna come and hang out for a few meetings, get a sense of what we're working on, you're welcome to do that too. Um, if you just want to read the meeting minutes to get a sense of where we are, um, it's all open and you can, uh, you know, look at things that we have there on the wiki and kind of our history. Um, also, Eric mentioned the Discuss platform, um, which is discussed at folio.org, and there are places for comments and to continue the conversation. So maybe you've watched this webinar and you don't feel um, that you're really ready to comment on anything, you want to go play with the prototype. Uh, you can look at both the initial sketches, which are also linked to the prototype and a video about the prototype. So if you'd like to see kind of uh, Philip discuss the prototype when he first created it, that is available from a link in uh, Discuss as well. And then um, we can have further conversation that way. Uh, so like I said, that's all that we have prepared for um, the uh, kind of prepared portion of this webinar. So we do have a lot of time for questions, and I'm hoping that we'll have a chance to have a conversation. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, so if you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the Q&A box within WebEx, or if you prefer to tweet, uh, please use the hashtag Folio Forum. Uh, so far we have one question. Uh, so does the system indicate selected license terms such as ILL rights? Yeah, I can take that one. And I should have mentioned that actually. Um, that is part of the license record is that there will be some form of license mapping where you can pull out terms that um, are important to your institution or terms like ILL rights is a good example that might even be actionable by other parts of the system. So being able to say, yes, this is allowed to be loaned and maybe that the system can act on that in some way. Um, we haven't gotten into really like the nitty gritty of exactly how the terms will be mapped yet. Um, but I think we do know that we would want there to be some level of kind of default terms, so popular things that we think a lot of libraries would be interested in having, but then also having some ability to customize. So if there's a particular term that a library negotiates or that is unique to you, that you'd be able to create a field for that and map it as well and possibly have business rules around that too. So that will definitely be part of the license. Um, I think there's some question about, you know, timing and what is most important to do and, and if we have a phased approach to licensing. And I think our preliminary thoughts were that just having the license record, the ability to upload documents and create relationships would be kind of the phase one first things we would do. And then having a more robust mapping abilities would be kind of the next thing on the list. 
but we definitely would be open to hearing feedback about if there's other features that people particularly want to see. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, we have somebody who says, I don't have a question, just a compliment. This has really come together and I am now really understanding how it is going to work. Great job. Thanks, that's great to hear. Yeah. Another question just came in. Would bib records be part of the knowledge base? So I think that's sort of undetermined at this point. I think there's definitely a hope that they will be. And then I think there's also a thought that like, you know, the, your catalog and the bib records themselves are actually a form of a knowledge base. And how much that's integrated with more of like a traditional e-resources type knowledge base may depend on the source of both of your record types and how well they can come together. But I think that for sure there's a desire to be able to say that there, to create linkages between those things. So if you've got a particular bib record and then you've got knowledge base holdings that match up to different packages and things to be able to create the relationships there so that you could say this bib record has four different holdings um, or to be able to say this holding links to this bib record and be able to do things like manage vendor records and external record sources as well. Um, and th those are just kind of the areas that have come up in discussion. Um, the actual data model for the knowledge base and the catalog is still in progress and we did have um, one forum about that, but I think it's a topic we know we would like to get back to. Uh, Chris, do you have anything to add? Um, I would just add that the metadata management SIG has been having some discussions about this, and so thinking about where um, BibFrame is going to fit in with the, uh, the data that's stored within Folio, thinking about how linked data is going to help um, show relationships both with content within Folio and without is all part of um, the like the data model that's, um, that's being discussed. And if you look on Discuss, uh, there is a post with, the, with kind of the data model as it currently exists that you can take a look at and it kind of covers a lot of that detail. Um, but like Kristen said, it is a work in progress so we'd be really interested in more feedback in that area. Okay, the next question we have is, will the, licensing will the licensing management provide a means to build hierarchical relationships between general licenses and amendments? Um, I guess we haven't gotten to that level of detail yet, but I think most likely, yes. Um, I think, I mean, I think we want it to be flexible enough that people can do things the way that makes sense for them, but I think it's pretty much become an industry standard now that there's some way to kind of say this is the license and these are all the amendments to that license, if for some reason you wanted to actually have a separate record for every amendment, you'd probably be able to do that as well. But I think that's a use case that we're definitely aware of. Yeah, I think relationships between licenses is just another type of relationship that would have to be considered as well as like relationships between the license and a platform and a package and a, you know, a resource. Right, and that also brings up the question of just like relationships like a license gets superseded by a new license, be able to, being able to actually establish, you know, we had this license and then we signed a new one, so this one is no longer in use, this is, this is the one that took over and being able to map things like that as well. Will there be a notes field for the fund records? I think probably. I think there'll probably be notes fields for almost every record type. And the prototype doesn't really have enough detail to show that right now, but um, I'm pretty sure that's something we'll want as much as possible because there's always going to be something 
that you just didn't anticipate with the fields that are coded into the record. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Must the bib records be created in Folio, or will there be, there be the ability to import from another source, such as Z3950, OCLC? Yeah, I can't imagine a, a current uh, library services platform not being able to interface with other, um, you know, essentially knowledge bases of bib records like OCLC. And so I think a lot of us that are working on Folio, our bibliographic record creation process does not start in our local system. Uh, so even, um, I, I would say that is, I don't know if, I would go quite as far to say that's sort of the primary way that this has been thought about because this is really more in the metadata management realm, but I know that that is a critical workflow that metadata management is definitely going to support. And another, another side of that as well is that we're also thinking along the lines of the idea of cataloging by reference, and this sort of ties into the idea of bib records as a knowledge base that there may be some shared knowledge base of bib records um, or multiple groups, multiple collections of bib records that can have a, a link with Folio and that rather than having to download local copies of all the records um, into your, your version of Folio, that you would be able to use a model of just kind of saying, okay, uh, these are the bib records that I have holdings for and then there would be some localized version where you could manage the information that's unique to your institution without having to duplicate that entire record in your system. So that may actually go a little bit even beyond just importing records. Can you talk about what happens both at the beginning and the end of the year with regards to funds? Sure. So again, we haven't necessarily mapped out the entire process yet, but we have begun to talk about things like fiscal year rollover and what does that mean. And so um, I think, you know, we'll definitely have the basic concept of fiscal years. As the fiscal year draws to a close, you'll be able to run some kind of process that will close down one fiscal year and create the next fiscal year. And we've talked a bit about about different ways that people manage their funds at year end, and so we want to support as many of those as possible. So um, we want to be able to do things like, say, um, roll over certain types of funds under different conditions. So maybe for firm order funds, you roll those over at zero, and then you just reallocate a new amount because they're different every year. Um, but you might be able to do things like for continuing resources funds, if you, if you know that either a certain package or just in general you're expecting a certain inflation rate that you're going to have to meet, you might be able to say roll this fund over with a 5% increase to account for inflation. Um, if you have um, things like endowments, you might want to roll over just the ending balance of the previous year becomes the starting balance of the next year. So basically being able to sort of set business rules based on fund types that say what happens to the money at rollover. And I think that's pretty standard um, yeah. with ILSs already. We've had several uh, initial conversations about how institutions are currently doing rollover, but um, that's not really represented in the prototype as of yet, but um, being able to start and end of fiscal year is part of what we see version one uh, functionality supporting. Since hopefully people will use Folio for more than one fiscal year, right? <laughs> Is there a plan to integrate usage data and cost data in the resource management system? Yeah, that's maybe not going to happen in version one, but it is a recognized uh, need that all of us do. And, you know, one of the things that um, has come out both in kind of our own thoughts here as well as um, some of the presentations that I've seen at conferences is how the renewal process is not particularly well supported by any one system right now. Um, and it may not be that Folio does all of it within itself, but there may be opportunities for Folio to integrate with, say, other usage collection services as well as perhaps an app that would support 
collecting usage data and then getting that data and being able to um, bring it together with acquisitions data in a way that will be beneficial. So um, that's something that is, is going to warrant more conversation about how to do that. Um, and it, that's a really tricky area, and I think that's something that um, has been a challenge for like all libraries and all systems that we're still trying to address. Are there any other questions? Going once, going twice. Well, I think we we can call it a day then. Um, so this can. Let's see. Oh. Um, yeah. I am. Um, I just got a chat. Uh, from a user that says that his questions are not coming through. So I don't know where they might be going. Yeah, I'm not seeing that. Uh, Sent them to host. Yeah, I'll come find you. Okay, so let me see if I have messages just to me. All right, well, I do see one that pops up here. So what is the timeline for fleshing out the programming itself um, going beyond the U.S.? Uh, so it, I think in answering that question, um, some of the other forums that are out there would be beneficial to take a look at. So a couple, a couple weeks ago, and I know this forum didn't get recorded, we went through the timeline for version one. And I'm getting a little echo, so I apologize. I think um, that might be the host account. If we can mute that one again. Yeah, so if you can, thanks. So um, Harry Kaplanian at EBSCO did a uh, folio forum looking at the version one timeline. And that is up on the OLE blog um, that maps out when the programming and the development is going to happen, say, behind the, the UX UI. And that's getting fleshed out in more detail as well, kind of talking about um, number of uh, developers and number of designers that might need to work on some of these different areas. Uh, there is still an anticipation, and we are still on track for having a, a version one deliverable in about mid-2018. And I realize that that's a little vague, um, but I don't have the kind of the general timeline in front of me. But if you do, the slides are posted for that um, for that folio forum that you can take a look at. And finally, um, updating on the, the kind of general timeline and development is something that we'll be repeating about once a quarter to provide a check on where we are and then be able to delve into a little more detail on the development work that has happened. Okay, and then a few more questions have come in. Uh, would, Folio, would the Folio knowledge base integrate with vendors knowledge base? So I think the answer is that we hope that it will be able to. Um, and I guess there's sort of a question, you know, there may not actually be a Folio knowledge base per se. Um, you know, that could evolve. But the idea, I think, is that <clears throat> at least to start, we might, <clears throat> excuse me, we might be able to integrate with existing knowledge bases through the APIs that Folio is offering. And so um, because EBSCO is involved in the project, I think we're assuming that they will definitely want to make their knowledge base available to integrate with Folio. Uh, but we don't really want to see this just become only EBSCO's knowledge base working with Folio. So we're definitely encouraging other vendors and other people out there who might be running different types of knowledge bases to get in touch and talk about the possibility of integration. I think kind of the holy grail of Folio and really of a whole next-gen system in general is the idea of a single point of management. So ideally, we would love to be able to say, like, from within Folio, you can work with your bib records and your licensing and all your, your internal operations and then also be able to kind of push that out to your discovery tools in some way. And so maybe there's, you know, because of that knowledge base integration, you can just do that all in one place. Maybe you do it within Folio, but then using the APIs, Folio can talk to your discovery knowledge base 
and kind of automatically set your holdings there. So I think there's different models that we could see for how that will work. But I think the goal is some kind of integration and hopefully at eventually some kind of integration even across different vendors. Is this taking the best parts of an ERMS and replacing the need for an ERMS for some libraries? Yeah, I think our goal so. <laughs> is that you wouldn't have to have a separate ERMS or if you choose to use portions of an ERMS that Folio can communicate with it in more of a, you know, system to system um, workflow as opposed to like a manual enter it in here and then enter it in their style of workflow. Uh, so I think we're, we're trying to be open to like not recreating the wheel and not forcing people to use something that maybe they feel like is substandard to what they're currently doing. We're trying to really um, elevate the level of communication within and across systems so that people will have choices and be able to um, build their workflows the way that works best for them. Will fund allocations be able to be uploaded from a file rather than manually keyed? I think that use case has come up before, and so that, but that's good to hear that that is a use case that um, people would want to see supported, and so we can make sure that that gets captured as we document our requirements. And this is more of a comment than a question. Uh, we have a spreadsheet that tracks a lot of different elements related to funds. It would be nice if the fund record could have more, many more fields than might be typical. Selector name, email, subject, broad area division, type of fund, endowment donation, gene. I think we would definitely want to support that. Um, some of those fields that are mentioned might be kind of hard coded into the fund record. Um, and then there's the whole idea of this kind of like tagging system would be that you can also create custom fields and custom values to go in those fields. So um, some of it may be out of the box, but then there may just be infrastructure that would allow you to create those fields within your record as well. Yeah, I think it's pretty common for a lot of us that we're having to slice and dice our, um, our spending based on, you know, for different reporting purposes. And so if we can apply, you know, perhaps you are applying those types of fields to a particular fund, or maybe, you know, you have a broader fund and at your time of paying an invoice, you want to be able to um, indicate some characteristics about what you're paying for. For example, if you on the same fund pay for continuing resources as well as for monographs, which you need to be able to distinguish those two or distinguish, you know, where you have a subscription and you lose access versus having, you know, some sort of a perpetual access and you want to distinguish those. Uh, we're thinking about all those different ways that, um, that libraries need to dig into their, the way that they're spending money and trying to support that. Well, um, I have not seen any other questions. Well, I'm glad we found that stash, so. <laughs> so I think we can go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, this concludes today's Folio Forum on Resource Management at Folio. You can continue the conversation at the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org, and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the openlibraryenvironment.org website. If you have feedback on this forum or have an idea for a future forum, please contact the forum facilitators at facilitators at ola-lists.openlibraryfoundation.org. Our next folio forum will take place on April 26th and will be a panel of members from each SIG discussing their work on the project. You can visit openlibrary.org for more details and link and the link will be there to register. Thank you to our speakers, Kristen Martin and Kristen Wilson, and to everyone who asked questions and added comments. Have a good rest of the week. All right, bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.